This is Fit to Succeed in partnership with NordicFitnessEducation.com with host Ben Pratt. Thanks for joining us. What system are we really trying to affect when we're trying to create some sort of motion and when we can create that motion, what system are we going to load now with force? Because if we can get the right systems to be loaded, then all of a sudden you don't have adhesions, you don't have, you know, muscles tearing or straining. Hello and welcome to another Fit to Succeed podcast. I am excited today because I have an old friend from years ago with me. His name is Ian O'Dwyer. He's a personal trainer from down under. Ian, it's great to, uh, to be with you today. Ben, so good to, uh, to catch up after all these years, mate. Yes, it's, as I said before, it's almost like a, a, a lifetime ago that we were uh, dancing around at Fit Pro and, and uh, you know, trading ideas and trading concepts. And, and here we are in 2018 and in our own parts of the world doing our own thing still. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I think it was 2004 when we first met and uh, I had the opportunity to listen to you as you taught on all things functional training. And, uh, you know, like you said, here we are years later. Now, perhaps just to give our listeners a, a, a bit of an understanding of your background, would you mind just briefly sharing with us how you got started in the fitness industry? Perfect. I think I think I break my background into four stages and it's really simple. Firstly, I grew up in a family of eight boys and one girl. Um, Dad was a horse breaker. So, when people sort of ask me about where I started with motion, movement, uh, hand on, hands-on practices, it was actually from horses. Yeah. So, you know, Dad was a, a real horse, what I call a horse listener. So he had the unique ability to be able to connect and really take horses that were challenged with all sorts of tissues in their, in their, in their bodies and also with their emotional state. So that was an area that I, I grew up in and, you know, horses ate better than the humans did, mate, as you well know, in those days. So um, <laughs> then I obviously, big family, played an abundance of sport. Uh, my professional or my semi-professional sport was AFL, but cross-country, basketball, tennis. Um, and, of course, along the way, I created an abundance of injuries, predominantly because of the way we were conditioning the tissues. Um, and then eight boys and one girl dad said you've got to have a you've got to have a background of some sort you could have a trade so i finished up we had two bills in the in the, in the family and i finished up being the third plumber so all right it's kind of <laughs> interesting people sort of say well how do you go from being a plumber to being where you are now um and then to in 1997 i just followed my dream and my passion and uh it was interesting because I got my diploma in fitness and, and, and I thought fitness is where I really wanted to be. But as I got down this journey, as you well know, the journey changes a lot of times and the journey wasn't necessarily about fitness, but probably more about wellness, wellness and well-being. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. I hadn't realized it was 97. You actually started in the industry. That was uh, not, not, not too far off from where I started as well, which is, uh, which is, which is great. Now, you, you've mentioned... obviously, obviously a good year. Say that again? Obviously a very good year, mate. Oh, it must have been, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned uh, a little bit about movement, and, and, and obviously uh, I've known you primarily for your ability to teach in things, all things function, uh, corrective exercise, and uh, your ability to optimize human movement. I know you've traveled the world and you've taught workshops all over the globe. Um, uh, what was it about this specific field of functional training, corrective exercise, that, that, that caught your attention, Ian? Benny, that's a great question. And I, I, I feel that the, 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 the reason I was drawn into what we termed as functional training was because what we did in human being conditioning, i.e. we stretched, we strengthened in isolation, we periodized in all sorts of, you know, 360-day or 65-day cycles, was completely the opposite of what we did with horses. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't seen too many horses come out of their box and do a hamstring stretch. And... <laughs> And, you know, it, there was always an incongruency for me because of the fact that I, the, the way we had these animals conditioned and what they could do, the speeds they could reach, the endurance they could create, um, but understanding where, were, where they were emotionally and, and what they needed was probably because they couldn't speak was something for me that I think and I felt that our industry really lacked. So I suppose there was three areas that I felt that we were lacking in in the industry of fitness back in those days. The first was that we couldn't connect to our clients. So, and not that that was the trainer's 
fault is how I think we were probably educating them. You know, we were trying to give them knowledge where we probably should have been given them the ability to be able to connect, to be able to listen, to communicate, to create an outcome for the client on that day that they actually felt comfortable and safe in. Um, the second thing, obviously, was the conditioning, how we condition it. You know, functional has had many definitions and, like, many words in our industry. There have been buzzwords and words that have been bastardised and thrown around. But really, for me, functioning was really just how do we condition the people to achieve their goal in a manner in which they needed to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the third thing was how do I empower that client? How do I empower that person when I'm not there? How do they know what to do? where to do it, when to do it, and when they do it, whether they feel that they're doing it well. Yeah. So I guess, you know, those three major areas, and as you've seen, you know, plays a big part of my conditioning side of things and, and getting people to be able to move again. Um, really, if we can create the connection and, and understand what they really need to do in their challenge or in their desired goal, uh, then empower them to know that there's tools and there's techniques and there's many things existing in the industry already that are fantastic that they can actually pull those in and use those. That's when we really get that success. And that's where I suppose I got driven into because of those three areas. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really fascinating. Now I, I know that you've obviously operated in, in Noosa in Queensland for quite some time now, uh, what 20 plus years you've had a, a studio <laughs> <Yeah>. there <laughs> and, uh, but you've also done obviously work in the early days with personal training on the net. You, you were one of the individuals involved in the early work with PTA Global. Uh, you know, you've know you been involved at a pretty uh, worldwide level and you've gone about and you've taught this concept of functional training. And I wonder where you are at now with how you would actually define the term functional training after all those years of experience. Mate, I don't know what you were doing. You've obviously been thinking about these questions because you're putting them in, in a situation where we're really going to try and define. And I love that. I love the fact that we actually define these terms. For me, functional training should create outcomes. You know, it should be addressing the challenge or the goal that prepares the necessary tissues of the human being, not human body, the human being, um, for the type of forces or stress that they are, are environmentally going to have to face. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like a lot of words, but all it really means is, is my client being conditioned in a way in which their tissues and we have to understand, you know, tissues are not just nerve, muscle, bone. We've got lots of other tissues that we probably put on the back burner because we're not taught about them. Mm -hmm. Or not that we don't get taught about them. We get taught about them, but we don't become inclusive, inclusive of them in conditioning people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very much about does it mimic what the person's goal is? Are we taking into effect what the environmental drivers are? And are we affecting the tissues in a manner in which the tissues will be needed, required, and then used in that environment? Yeah, I like what you said there, but you've made it very tissue focused that the tissues can operate in a manner that is effective. Because yeah. I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard this one, that a lot of people refer to functional training as being uh, the mode of training where you just train for what it is you need to do. But for example, you know, I can remember early in my years as a, as a tutor that I taught a girl who was a ballet dancer and mm -hmm. you, you could definitely see that she was uh, in the kind of shape she needed to do what she needed as a ballet dancer. But if I put on a treadmill, she literally couldn't run because she had to stay on her toes all of the time. And she got so much um, discomfort in the calf muscles from all of that work that she does as a ballet dancer. So I kind of saw that and thought, that's not functional. She right. might be able to train for ballet, but she isn't actually functional. Could you so, expand on that? So, so, Ben, we would suggest that that's possibly sports specificity. Ah. So, you know, if, if I was going to simplify how I define functional training, I would break it into three words, three categories. Tissue, motion, force. Okay. What are the tissues that I'm going to need to use in not just the sports specificity, but also in life? Now, I can condition, and, you know, we might talk nerve, muscle, bone, fantastic. We then might talk fascia. You know, that's become the buzzword since 2007. Um, but what about, you know, and if we look at those four components of that, really the nerve and muscle, uh, sorry, really the, 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 the muscle and the fascial tissue, the nerve, all have to work as a symphony. But what about blood? 
What about lymphatic systems? What about the epithelial tissues, the tissues that are the skin, the tissues that are the inside of the mouth, the inside of the anus, the tissues that are inside the gut that have to actually permeate and allow fluid to, trans to transition. Mm -hmm. They're really important tissues that if they don't function well, then we're not going to have well-being. So if I train an athlete just to be purposely driven in a sport, how are they going to heal? It's not going to be an overall picture. It's very much a zoom in and, and create an extreme athlete. But what about the person who has to pick up their children or who has to pick up shopping and put them in the back of their car? Or as you say, have to walk up and down stairs. They can't do it on point. Mm. So if their tissues are healthy, then my, first, my next question would be, okay, what's their motion like? Does it have rhythm and timing? Am I creating variation for their tissue? Are they working within their threshold? Does it incorporate their three complexes? And is it three-dimensional? Because if it has those five components, we generally see success in whatever that motion needs to look like. Mm -hmm. And then we turn to force. Well, the first thing I'd say in force is, is the force that we're putting into the body, does it have, have the ability for the body to have adaptation? Mm -hmm. So just like you said, very well to be able to dance, but how does she go when she has to walk up a set of stairs or on a treadmill? Can the tissue adapt? Does it mimic? Does it mimic what we need to do in a global expanse, or is it just mimicking a very select area? Mm -hmm. Does it create eustress or does it create distress? Now, if I've got a force that's going into the body, or forces going into the body that's creating a distress, I'm going to create inflammation. I'm going to create uh, toxic buildup, I'm going to create a breakdown in the immune system, I'm going to create, create a breakdown in the tissue. That's not what I need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have these scenarios that we then have to start to say, okay, what tissues am I actually starting to affect? Am I, is this person who's a ballet dancer, is she going to be a tensile type person or is she more of a contractile? Am I looking for more muscle dominated type movements? Am I looking for more fascial type movements or am I looking for a combination of both? And there'll be segments where you'll have to float in all three of them and out of all three of them. So it's, it's interesting, mate, because it's, it's a great question you ask and it's no matter what we do, sports specificity is fantastic. But we also have to bring people back into what happens post-sport. What happens when that dancer becomes a mum and now she's got this really goosey Lucy's tissue that, that can bend everywhere and now she's got relaxing going into a system, she falls pregnant, she has a child and now she needs more stiffness to create safety in her stability through movement. I think that's a, that's a fascinating insight because you're looking there at function outside of just a specific sport, which, uh, which of course matters. I, I can imagine that many people have witnessed, for example, on the athletic forum, you might see an athlete who's running down the track and in, in the moment they are at the top of their game, but then seconds later they've <laughs> fallen over, they're injured. You know, something's gone wrong, a tissue's torn or ripped and, and you're thinking, what happened in the difference between those few seconds, you know, being the best or one of the best in the world to now I'm actually on the floor and I can't even walk. Now, the next question is, how am I going to cope with that emotionally? Yeah, for because sure. <laughs> how I cope with it emotionally is going to have an effect on the healing process of the tissues and what tissues are going to be affected by the emotional state. This is the beautiful thing, you know, Ben, I, I love, I really love where we've gone with this in the last 10 years. I mean, I think people like you and I have always had the ability to ask questions and, and not be frightened to not have answers because I don't really believe there are answers. I believe there's, with every human being, there's a uniqueness and with that uniqueness, we have to ask questions and observe the outcomes. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing I really feel that now is that if we can understand how much this emotional plays in the healing process, especially for people who have never been injured before, which we're starting to see in my practices now, people who are 55 and 60, who have never had an injury and all of a sudden now they've got a knee injury or they've got an ankle injury and they just, they can't cope. Wow. Where for you and I, mate, we've had injuries all our lives and it's a I matter of like, <laughs> this, this is what we do, this is what we do, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a really, it's, it's, it's an interesting time when we start talking about, you know, as you say, that sports specificity and then coming back into life because I can guarantee you the biggest thing that breaks people's hearts is not being able to play with their kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Now, you mentioned just a minute ago, that's something I'd like to go into. You mentioned the, the, the term fascia being a buzzword since, uh, well, the last 10 years or so. Would you yeah. be able to describe for the listener more uh, what exactly is fascia and the extent throughout the body? All right. I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use Thomas Myers' 
um, definition here. And the reason I'm going to use, I do a lot of work with Tom and, you know, I think Tom, he's, he's, he's a poet when it comes to his words and he really puts it into a situation where he says, increasingly the scientific and research circles, what they're really looking at and professionals worldwide are stating that fascia has a wider definition. In other words, all collagenous based soft tissues in the body, including the cells that create and maintain that network of the extra, uh, extracellular matrix. What they're saying really that everything that includes all the tissues that we traditionally got designated as fascia. So, you know, whether it was the various types of fascia in and throughout, they're basically saying, plus all the very other similar tissues arrayed in different ways around the, around the body. So ligaments, tendons, bursa, all the fascia in and around the muscles. So the endomyosin, the perimyosin, the epimyosin, it's a nebulous network of tissue that really invagulates everything in the body. Now, I'm not saying fascia is the answer for everything, Ben, because I think that's what our industry does. It jumps down a rabbit hole and says, oh, okay, so core strength is the answer. Oh, fascia is the answer. Oh, function is the answer. No, 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 no. It's just another part of the system that we've got to put into the human being when we address them so that we can understand what the properties are of fascia, what fascia needs to be successful, how we need to condition it, um, what happens when we cut it? What happens when we break it? How do we then get it be, to become more successful when it's coming out of that, that recovery mode? So it's, you know, fascias, are, there's many types of fascia, reticulum, collagen, elastin, and water are predominantly uh, what it's made of. There's obviously very many other types of fascia. But if you just say, okay, it, it encases everything in the body. You know, there's more fascia in the brain than what there is grey matter and fat. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that tells you that, you know, when we look at fascia, mate, we know that the nerves that run throughout the muscle and fascia, well, fascia has six to ten times more proprioceptive uh, enrichment. So in other words, there's six to ten times more information being fed back to the brains of the body. Now, if that's the case, it's a bit like saying, okay, so the nervous system is dial up and, and fascia is the broadband system. Mm -hmm. One is not worse than the other. One is not superior. They need to work together because fascia encases the nerves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's really sorry. exciting when you start sorry. to put things back together. Sorry, buddy. I was going to say, so are, you said fascia encases the nerves. So are you referring to the myelin sheath? Is that a form of fascia? Yeah, yeah. So you think about a sheath. The word sheath, you know, we, we start to think about everything that has to slide and glide. And this is where we start to talk about when we move fascia and how we, we really need to get fascia to become hydrated. And, and if we can get that, that hydration and lubrication between the layers of the sheaths, then all of a sudden you find that you get this pumping motion, this lubrication and this sliding and gliding motion that allows the tip to become really, really healthy. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that as we get into into sure. that. Because that's a, as you mentioned that, that that's often one of the one of the problems, isn't it, of of injury uh, or uh, poorly functioning muscle tissue is that those fascia layers kind of become glued up. They kind of they develop what is known as adhesions, uh, yeah. and and then that creates dysfunction in the tissues because, like you said, one bit of muscle tissue doesn't slide effectively over another, uh, and it starts to create a, a point of tension. Is that is that how you would that, do it? Absolutely. And Benny, that's beautifully put. And I think. You know, if we took, if we took just, just say we cut out the hamstring muscle and we cut it in half and we look down that hamstring muscle, mm -hmm. you'd find every fibril, every fiber, and every, every muscle itself as a collective, every fibril is encased in fascia. Then those bunches of fibrils are encased in fascia, which make fibers, and those fibers never encased. So all of a sudden, you've just got this stuff that's just continuously laid in amongst. So every fibril has to be able to slide and glide in multitude of directions. So it's not just, you know, we sort of have it in our head that a hamstring has to slide over a hamstring or has to slide over an adductor. When we actually delve deep inside into the muscles themselves, they all have to interact, interconnect, and inter, inter, intercommunicate with themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's an amazing system when you start to, to delve that deep. You know, we even talk about now... I know we're finding now with SMR that we used to say, you know, that using a foam roller and, and going into the muscular tendinous region and 
and getting into the Golgi tendon, that would then relax the muscle spindle. Well, what's interesting is the muscle spindle's in the belly of the muscle, which we know, but guess what it's encased in? Pressure, eh? Pressure. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So it's, we've just got to get smarter at asking the questions of what system are we really trying to affect when we're trying to create some sort of motion and when we can create that motion, what system are we going to load now with force? Because if we can get the right systems to be loaded, then all of a sudden you don't have adhesions. You don't have, you know, muscles tearing or straining. And it's, you know, once again, mate, we're, you know, we went back and when we were teaching stuff, we were talking about muscles and, and now we know that muscles don't stretch and you're going, okay. So we've got this tissue. Oh, that, right. I think you're going to need to clarify that for our listeners. The muscles don't stretch. Yeah. You want to go, go. So, so what, this, what the research is showing now is that if we go into, you know, let's call it a, let's call it a, whether it's a soleus or whether it's a gastroc, that when our foot is hitting the ground, the gastroc will actually shorten or it will go into a situation where it just holds the position. It doesn't actually give. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, what will happen is that the tissues on the outside of the tissue will give and guess what the tissue is? It's fascia. fascia. So we've been stretching muscle for 25 years thinking we're stretching a gastroc or a hamstring or whatever it may be. And in effect, that may not necessarily be what we need to want to actually do in some cases. I'm not saying all cases because we have various types of tissue. Some tissues you know, are loosey-goosey, some tissues are very stiff. Sometimes we need to change the plasticity of tissue in muscles and in around muscles and, and various types of fascial tissue. But it's what I'm saying is that I'm not saying stretching is bad. I'm saying we need to understand the tissues and we need to understand their role so that we can give them the outcome that they need. Right. So if we, get a, if we get a muscle that goes into an isometric contraction, so let's call it a gastroc and it goes into an isometric contraction and it holds the, it holds the force, which is what it does, and then it passes the force onto the fascial tissue and the fascial tissue starts to give in whatever direction it can. And then what will happen is that will recoil, which creates a stretch to, to eccentric lengthening to concentric, concentric contraction effect, eccentric loading. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm with you. I'm with you. Now it's, so, it's, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so it's interesting, buddy, because it's, I spent 25 years of my, of my football career stretching. And, you know, I've got a loosey-goosey tissue, which is the tissue you shouldn't have been stretching, right? Mm -hmm. And towards the end of my career when I didn't stretch and I actually just started using more movement, guess what happened? Less injuries, better performance, better recovery. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's exciting for us because you and I and all those people who are really delving to ask the questions and see if we can find better solutions, we're now starting to get answers that aren't biasing people. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's probably been a problem with our industry is we've, we've biased it with our own belief mechanism instead of saying, well, hang on, you know, what are we seeing in our clients? Uh, what's the research and science saying? Is it congruent to what we're seeing in our clients? Mm -hmm. um, and whether it is or isn't congruent, are we questioning or challenging or are we just accepting it as being, you know, mm -hmm. the dogma or the myth or the truth that it may be? Yeah, I think uh, what you're sort of saying there, which is really important, I think, as personal trainers, is that even though we are putting ourselves out there as experts in health and fitness, we still need to learn. And as we learn more we, and we understand, we have the right to change our position and we might actually begin to teach things differently. Uh, and, and maybe, as you suggest, even sometimes a 180 on our past thought processes because that's what learning and knowledge is all about, after all. It's called evolution, right, mate? Yeah, it is. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned there a, a little bit about... Um, some of the parameters around dealing with the fascia or training tissue. And I know that you have uh, written a really interesting blog on your website that begins to look into these principles. And one of the things that you talk about on there is you talk about vector variation. Could you describe what you mean by vector variation? Well, vector is just a point and direction of force that we apply to tissue. So, you know, if I, if I was standing on a single leg and I put a band around my hip and I took it around, took it out at, at at a level equivalent to my hips. In other words, the band was perpendicular to the floor. And if I pulled on that band, I would have a horizontal pull on my hips going in a lateral effect. If I raised the end of the band and took it up to shoulder height, I would have a, cre a different creation of force now being applied on the tissue. Mm -hmm. 
So what we now know is, is that if we look at the tissues of the body and if we look at the fabrics, which I, I term them as being just like fabrics, and they run in so many different directions that have to slide and glide, the more that we can feed vector variation, in other words, different lines, different points of force that travel through the tissue in a safe and effective manner, which we call threshold, then what happens, Ben, is that when we go to put our bodies under load mm -hmm. and our bodies have to shift into something that may not be traditionally sagittal, frontal or transverse, then the tissues don't spasm, they don't get bullied, they don't, they don't get scared, they actually say, yeah, we can go here because we've been conditioned to go here. Mm -hmm. So it's really a way in which we can condition the tissue better, we can prepare the tissue better for the variation of stresses or forces that the client that the client will probably have to go through in their sport or their everyday life. And I think, you know, one of the, the, the greatest examples of that is the shoulder. I mean, the shoulder recognises, the shoulder joint recognises 16,000 positions. Wow, that's a huge amount. And we train it, and we train it in, what, probably six or seven. Yeah, if that. <laughs> if that, that's right. So, so it's interesting, mate, and if we understand, if we look, if we just looked at the shoulder joint and go, wow, okay, it's not a big joint. It doesn't have a deep capsule. You know, we look at the fabric of the fascial lines and we start to look at where they run to and, and what they connect to. The shoulder takes a hell of a lot of force and a hell of a lot of pressure. And if we just get a little bit smarter at how we can condition it, a lot of times, even though we've had tissues that have been damaged or broken, supraspinatus tears and various types of rotator cuff injuries, people can live a very normal life and can actually get, you know, pretty much back to a very good range of motion mm -hmm. and the quality of life they want if we just give the tissue what it needs in a safe, effective and you know, happy motion. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, you, you reminded me of something that, that, that Gary Gray taught, uh, and he always says that, that even though there are some movements that in different body parts that are less common, we might not do them as much, that doesn't mean that training them is not functional. As a matter yeah. of fact, we should train them because, as you suggested, when we move in these perhaps less common ways, it helps prepare those tissues for those occurrences when they happen. I had a guy in this morning, Ben, and it was interesting. He's a, a guy, 65, got a 12-year-old. He's strong. He's trained every day. He's been a corporate, you know, had his own business. So he's always had a bit of stress. And he said, um, partially tore his supraspinatus. And he rang me and said, oh, do you think you can do anything for me? And I said, look, come in. We'll have a look and see what we can do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've done, done a little bit of hands-on work. I've, I've done a little bit of stuff on the wall with him. And I, I actually put him into a, a sprinter's position on the wall. Right. And as I said, you know, I don't want to use these big motions with these levers so that your arms are flying everywhere because it's going to put too much, too much doubt in the shoulder itself to say, hang on, are you going to hurt me, damage me, or, or what's going on here? So we just did this running motion, basically driving his you know, into a knee lift and he's on an incline on the wall. So he's, he's basically being able to push his leg back and he's got full extension over his head. And he said, wow, my hands are against the wall. They're not even moving, but my, sh my shoulder blades are moving everywhere. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. you know, we take the tissue and, and Gary Gray's had a huge influence on us, on us all over the years with, with his brilliance of how he looks at it. Um, and I guess... I guess for me, all I'm trying to do is because, you know, fascia isn't something that Gary he teaches now, but he didn't teach a lot of back then. And fascia for me was probably that missing point because I still don't believe we move it as well as we should move it. And it's funny, I did, did some stuff with Tom Myers this year over in, over in Maine and, and uh, Tom and I, as I said, he's a great guy, been a friend for many years now. And he said, I just can't believe how you move people and they respond so quickly. And I said, well, I, I guess, Tom, it's the fact that I probably don't judge the movement, as in I don't think that this is what the movement's got to look like. Mm -hmm. If you can just let the person move first and then, you know, as you know, you can change the foot position, you can change the hand position, you can change whatever part of the body you want to try and get to move. You can even change their emotional state and that will change a lot of things, especially in the tissue. And I think an important, an important aspect there, Ian, that to bring out is that when we are um, restricted or conformed by what we think is correct movement technique because of perhaps our prior learning, then that can really limit the way in which we look at how a body part should move. You know, for example, we're taught that the deltoids do a, a, a certain number of movements. And so therefore, when we apply training to the shoulder, we only want to move within those parameters because exercise technique tells us so.
Yeah, I think Ben, that's that's a beautiful that's a beautiful point to bring up because we, as I said before, it's our own biases that can create the limitations of what and how we evolve. Mm. Um, you know, I, I feel for if, if people say to me, you know, oh, so they go, so what's new in your in your in your movement pattern or regime today? And I go, no, I'm still doing the same stuff. <laughs> and you know, my stuff changes from day to day, get alone from year to year. <laughs> but I, I guess there's there's always fundamentals that you work from. And, you know, I've just started doing some stuff again that I did back in 2007, 2008. And I thought, I wonder why I went away from that back then. But I think it's just that you continually evolve and ask questions and challenge. And, and sometimes the most simple, fundamental and powerful movement gets evolved. And we sort of got to do that full circle to come back and say, oh, yeah, this is where I left you. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Nice one. <laughs> now, you mentioned a little earlier the, the ideas of rhythm and timing. and uh, Obviously, the body has many rhythmical movements. I mean, walking, running itself, those basic movements that we have, bipedal motion, uh, are very mm. rhythmical and have a certain element of timing. But, but clearly, injury can throw that off. I mean, why is it so important for us to consider training with rhythm and timing uh, and not just uh, thinking about creating some element of contraction? Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Um, firstly, as you said, we have rhythm and gait. But then we have rhythm in breathing, we have rhythm in circulation, we have rhythm in the hormonal system, we have rhythm in sleep, we have rhythm in cell regeneration. So that would tell me that, yes, we can train without rhythm, and I have no problem with that, but if we're going to perform, there has to be a rhythm. So when we talk about rhythm, I talk about allowing tissues to load and unload so they're going to eccentrically lengthen and they're going to concentrically contract mm -hmm. now if i'm a bodybuilder i don't want to let something eccentrically lengthen first i might want something to concentrically contract so once again getting back to my client's goals will drive me into what tool what style and what level i use for them mm -hmm. but understanding that if they're going to be like you said before you had a ballet dancer they're all about rhythm because they're lean and the tissues they're going to use for strength aren't necessarily going to be big quads and glute muscles and, and um, hamstrings. They're going to be more of the fascial tissue that can now take the stress, mitigate the stress and create a tension to give them these beautiful profiles. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge, for me, it's a huge thing to have because if we look at anything, if we look at a pianist, if we look at an, uh, a golfer, if we look at a cricket player, if we look at a soccer player, if we look at any person that performs any type of intricate exercise, mm -hmm. their timing of their ankle, their hip and their T-spine is optimal, and which means the rhythm will be optimal in their movement. Now, remember what I said before, Ben, is that for me to move, my heart has to be involved with my movement because it's got to provide the blood and the oxygen. My hormonal system needs to be involved with it. So it's better be in good rhythm with my movement system. Mm -hmm. And what encases all this stuff? Fascia. Fascia. <laughs> so all of a sudden, mate, we start to tie in. And if I've got to get, you know, I've got four hearts, you know, from a solar perspective, we would say the body's got four hearts, uh, sorry, four brains. And we would say, okay, so if these brains are producing hormones and those hormones have to travel to all over the body, then having the most effective system that can get them there is crucial. So the rhythm and timing for me is everything because when we start looking at rhythm and timing, I, I consider that to be the new reconditioning or the, renew, the new rehabilitation. Because when you see people with shoulder injuries and they can't, you know, they can't AB duck the shoulder and yet I can put them into a standing position and start just using a, you know, a short bar and just letting them swing like a pendulum and all of a sudden they take their shoulder and they can do this AB duction, you go, mm -hmm. what's happening there? Amazing. Eh? You know, yeah, it is. And it's just, but it's, it's the factor I think made it, it's, it's letting them reconnect everything in their body. You know, they can breathe because, oh, okay, you're not going to make me AB duck because that gives me pain and I don't want the pain and the pain creates migraines and I'm, I'm really scared of migraine. So all of a sudden now it's just, once again, the emotional, the mental, the physical, it all ties together. It all has to be in rhythm. And if it is, that's when we get the best, we get optimal, optimal decision-making, great clarity, better confidence, you know, better quality of life. Excellent. 
Uh, we're just coming up on time, but I, I've got two quick questions just to ask you. Obviously, you mentioned there's SOMA, and I want to give you an opportunity just to explain to people what this SOMA acronym means and what it is you're doing with Rodney Korn, and then yep. I'll ask you one last question. Perfect. All right. So SOMA is a collaborative system that optimizes the regeneration to tissues. And all that really means is that we want to empower people to move better, to feel better, and to live better. Rodney and I have both had extensive careers in the industry. Um, from professional sport to, you know, regeneration, recovery, rehabilitation. So, and what we've seen over the years is that we've got amazing tools in the industry, but everyone seem, seems to want to work by themselves. We mm -hmm. want to actually bring people together. Like you've seen in your years and your previous years of, of teaching, there's, there's all these educators that are doing their own thing. But if we actually combine some of this stuff, there's some pretty powerful outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we've got some IP of our own. We do fascial mobilizers. We do uh, osteofascial release, which is another way of using the foam roller. <clears throat> Not right or wrong, just another way of changing the tissue. We use functional reconnection from Greg Roscoff's um, MAT uh, systems. We use SMR, as I said. We use play, we use breathing. So we bring in a lot of areas, a lot of things that are already existing in the, in the industry to delete the confusion, to create more techniques and applications that can create outcomes. Yeah. So it's really cool. There's three levels. There's what we call level one, which is about awareness and technique. In other words, are you aware of how well you move, what you do, and uh, then we teach techniques on how we can change that. Level two is about observation. And observations are really key element as you well know mate but not only observation of what's it's extrinsic but what's intrinsic mm -hmm. and of course then that observation is combined with programming how do we take all of the techniques that we've been given and how do we now assemble them to make a complete puzzle so that we can actually feel better move better live better and then of course a level three which is the integration and the coaching so the integrating of the awareness of the observation to create solutions and then the coaching for the client in a style that empowers successful outcomes. So it's, it's a really, really effective system. And I guess, you know, what we've really noticed with what we're doing, we've been, we've been to Australia, the U S China, Singapore, uh, New Zealand now with SOMA and the amount of people in the industry now, mate, that are actually on the brink of breaking themselves oh, wow. is, through the roof, is through the roof Ben. So it's been interesting to see how it's helped them as coaches They've come away from the weekend going, my goodness, all, all of a sudden now I can think better, I feel better, I've got a better, I've got a better position in, in where I'm standing. And that's, that's so crucial because you and I both know, you know, who looks after us? Mm -hmm. You know, you're doing this podcast not because it's going to make you a million dollars, because you care about what happens to people. Mm -hmm. You know, but the trouble is that when you give because you care, who gives back to you? Yes, quite often the, uh, the, the trainers, uh, like you said, they're, they're so involved in helping their clients that they don't have the same time and effort to put into themselves. And it's their, their own training and effort is, is literally a last gasp thing in, in a break somewhere. Yeah, exactly right. So therefore, mate, you know, what that creates now is a lack of sustainability. It creates a lack of success because your decision making, your solutions, your choices aren't optimal. But more importantly, now it changes your emotional state. So you as a coach, you as a leader, you as a guide now become substandard. And once again, that sustainability starts to decrease because people aren't going to come back to you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something, you know, we're really passionate about it. And it's nice because it just bolts on to existing, existing um, qualifications. If, you know, it bolts on the NASM, it bolts on the ACE, it bolts on the ACSM, it bolts on the Premier, it bolts on the whatever's out there because it uses a lot of the stuff that's in there plus some of our own proprietary stuff. Oh, fascinating. Well, we'll certainly uh, link in the show notes for, for the SOMA website so people can have a look further at what you're doing in uh, yeah. uh, along with, uh, with Rodney Korn. Now, just last question, quick sort of 30 second answer if you can. What do you, what would you, <laughs> I know that's hard. What would you say is the primary difference between how you apply functional training now versus the yep. way that you looked at it 20 years ago? What's the main difference? Patterns. Patterns, right. Patterns. Everything we do in life is a pattern. The way we sleep is a pattern. The way we move is a pattern. The way we eat is a pattern. The way we interact is a pattern. Everything we have, the brain revolves around patterns. The way we're taught, the way we socialize, everything we do is a pattern. So what I'm looking for now is, wow, what's the pattern that this person has? And I wonder what's driving it. Because if I can find out what the pattern is and then find out what's driving that pattern, then nine times out of 10, you'll change them like that. 
Well, that's a, that's a fascinating answer. I, I, you know what? You, you gave me about six different thoughts just as you said that, but I think we're going to have to hold that for another time. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's been such a pleasure talking to you uh, and uh, just exploring some of your own thoughts and in your own progression in the world of functional training and really appreciate your time and your expertise. Thanks, Benny. And Ben, can I say thank you to you, mate? It's, it's, it's hard being an island unto yourself and we all are. We all have this huge desire to, to make life easier for the people who are listening and watching this. And, um, you know, what they don't see is the, the, the 20 years of, of work that we've both put in to get to where we are now. And we can laugh and banter about what, what we've done. But um, we, we, the practitioners, we, the educators, really thank people like you as well because you're doing an amazing job, mate. And this is another way of exposing what people can do to help themselves become better for them. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share via social media. You can also rate the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us, then check out our range of online courses at www.nordicfitnesseducation.com.